All right, I think we are alive. Uh, my name is Paulo Javier. I am a poet and uh, the program director of Poets House. Poets House is located on 10 River Terrace. I'm actually not streaming from Poets House. I'm streaming from Western Queens. But just uh, so everyone knows, Poets House is located in Lower Manahata, Manhattan in Lenape Haking, or Ehende Wakitit, the traditional and ancestral land of the Canarsie, Capsi, Huerpos, Siwanoi, and Wekwasquik, collectively known today as the Ramapo, Nanticoke, Leni, Lenape, and Delaware Lenape. I offer my respect to Lenape peoples and uh, to their continuing presence in their homeland and throughout the diaspora, I offer my reverence. This, this acknowledgement is merely a beginning, serving to align Poets House and to contiguously extend the organization in community outreach with the Ramapo and Nanticoke Leni Lenape, who have survived despite a 400 year imposed migration and who deserve acknowledgement for their endurance and ancestral ties to our brilliant city called New York. We heart NYC. Likewise, it is important to acknowledge the Mohawk iron workers who built the city skyscrapers from the ground up and became known as Men of Steel, reference Superman, for bravely walking steel beams without harnesses. I sincerely hope that this acknowledgement underscores my own and Poets House's commitment to the process of dismantling the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Via programs such as tonight, which we hope promotes a deeper conversation between individuals, communities, and nations. In this moment we are in, we seek to strengthen the ties of community outreach, and Poets House firmly values the power of poetry to foster dialogue and exchange. Without further ado, I would actually like to invite my co-host tonight, Reggie Harris. So Reggie is uh, going to be participating in our program. So turn it over to you, Reggie. All right, thank you, Paolo. Uh, it's great to be here and it's great to have everyone on. Uh, I'll be brief because I know everyone wants to hear Diane Glancy. Uh, Poets House is a, a 70,000 volume poetry library and literary center, as Paolo mentioned, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, what we try to do is we try to collect as much of the poetry written in the United States as possible. Uh, every year we have what's called the showcase where we try to collect the newest books from a range of publishers from self-published to uh, university presses all the way through small presses, everything if possible, and then put it on display. Uh, we try to be, um, as uh, Courtney Yassidi said in the, little mo in the little movie, the hive mind of American poetry. Uh, so you can find all different types of poetry and poems on our shelves. Uh, today, uh, we're very happy to have Diane Glancy join us, and we're glad to have you join us as well. We have a uh, little Twitter um, contest, actually. If you think of a question that you wanted to ask Diane uh, during the presentation or at, at the presentation during the Q&A, you can uh, contact us through Twitter. Um, the hashtag is Poets House Live. So that's hashtag Poets House Live uh, to ask your question. And we will pick one question to be our winner if you will, uh, sort of like the best question or the favorite, our favorite question. And the winner will receive a, a signed copy of Diane's book, courtesy of her publisher, which we uh, greatly appreciate. So thank you for that. So now I'll turn it back to Paolo and we can go on with Diane. Great, thank you so much, uh, Reggie. And uh, I am just really eager to bring Diane Glancy on. I think I'm going to keep my introduction quite personal, but you can find out more information about Diane Glancy, her new book, which we're going to be talking about tonight, and her fantastic press, Turtle Point Press Online. Uh, my um, introduction to Diane Glancy um, actually spanned several years ago when I was a public school teacher. I'm streaming, by the way, from Sunnyside, Queens, where I live, and uh, my fellow Queens people, my heart is with you, especially in this moment. But I work very closely with um, a high-need school just in Astoria, and uh, 
poetry is actually very hard to come by when you're teaching in a public school system here in New York City. And I think generally stories take precedence, but Diane Glancy's poetry actually resonated with my students across three grades. And uh, it's one of the proudest uh, experiences I had as a teacher. And I think it speaks volumes about the power of Diane's poetry, which really um, spans nation, spans time, spans history, and spans culture, and really locates the reader right in the heart of the poem. Uh, and so I am so honored to actually be invite, being uh, inviting and having my teacher uh, join us for this very first live stream. So Diane Glancy, thank you so much for joining our first live stream. Thank you, Paolo. It's good to be here. Uh, Diane, just want to make sure, uh, where are you streaming from? Shawnee Mission, Kansas. Shawnee Mission, Kansas. Okay, great. So from Sunnyside, Queens to Shawnee Mission, Kansas, Diane will be uh, presenting a craft talk on her brilliant and vital new book. Uh, and I'm so honored to welcome Diane Glancy to our program tonight. Thank you, Paolo. It's good to be here. And thank you especially for your words earlier. I appreciate that. So you asked me to do a craft talk on Island of the Innocent a consideration of the book of Job. I've always liked the book of Job. I bought William Blake's illustrations of Job 44 years ago. Inside the cover I wrote April 25th, 1976, Sunday afternoon, Nelson Art Gallery, Kansas City. I wrote a few poems long ago. They are in part three, Butter Beans, Job the Comet Man, Comet Man's Wife, and eventually with Dreams Upon My Bed from Blake's illustration number 11 that Turtle Point used for the cover. Other genres begin offering their parts to the poetry collection, dramatic voice and plot. Job is a man blindsided by disaster. He loses his 10 children, his herds and flocks. He is covered with boils. Three friends arrive accusing him of wrongdoing. What have you done, Job, they say. Even the townspeople of Uz mock him. There's nothing like suffering to bring out one's character. I kept writing over the years as I worked on other projects. Toward the end of writing, it seems that every scrap of experience was broken into parts for the book. In 2007, I listened to the book of Job on tape as I drove 1,231 miles from Kansas City to Western Nebraska and back to see an exhibit of native artifacts on loan from the Smithsonian. I quoted a few passages from Job in the long arc of my driving, one of the poetic prose pieces in the book. There are also other forms, a villanelle, a sestina, a sonnet titled, Fly Swatter, Meat Cleaver for the Standard Kitchen and an abstract essay on poetics, more than content is the manner in which it is held. Someone asked me to write and then didn't publish it. And so we march on one step at a time. My grandmother was a quilt maker. In those days, fabric was sparse. We held onto our clothing or she would cut it into pieces and stitch it to other pieces of fabric to make patterns for her quilts. Near death, her hand kept stitching. She sewed to the end of the road. It has occurred to me that I do the same thing. I take different stories and cut pieces from them and sew the pieces together in various patterns. For Island of the Innocent, a consideration of the Book of Job, I took Job's voice, the voices of Job's friends, of Job's wife, and my own voice. I took the fabric of Job's suffering the suffering of the Native American, the suffering of George Custer and his wife Libby when their plans were dashed, and bits of other histories and sewed them together. Poetry, especially an experimental work, is like sewing, using stitches to hold the different pieces together, edges of cloth that have been cut, that have been wounded in the cutting. 
working on a project for a long time, certain images, events, visages, thoughts, paste themselves to you, and you find research and writing are a clothier. You wear experiences that make a wrestle, a noise of moving. I wrote an introduction to hold the dissident parts together. I wanted to explore the book of Job with poems and poetic prose until the fissures appeared. Other times and places bled into the story. Among the first to disrupt the text were the Indians and the history of America. Feathers appeared over the ridge of the hill. The feathers were on headdresses. The headdresses were on heads. The Indians were foreign to the story of Job as far as it had been understood. But if ever there was trial and suffering, 6,000 years didn't matter. The Indians could step forward Job could step back, current to whatever circumstance there is. Then I wrote another introduction to hold the disparate parts together. The title of the book is there only in the King James Version of the Bible. When men are cast down, then you shall say, there is a lifting up and he shall save the humble person. He shall deliver the island of the innocent and it is delivered by the pureness of your hands. Job 22. 29 to 30. This is the Revised Standard Version. For God abases the proud, but saves the lowly. He delivers the innocent man, and you will be delivered through the cleanness of your hands. I like the wobbliness of translation, the inability of something there when viewed from a certain way and not there when viewed from another. I like the other uncertainties. Who has clean hands, even when pride was found? in the upright Job, and where is the island of the innocent? There is no man that sinneth not, 1 Kings 8, 46. There is not a just man on earth that doeth good and sinneth not, Ecclesiastes 7, 29. On earth there is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3, 10. I've been in academia long enough that I know Christianity is not a focus, but it is one of mine. Job's trials began when God asked Satan if he had seen his blameless and upright servant, Job. Satan answered, give him to me a while and he will curse your name. I expected more of God than to brag to Satan. It is one of those, my dog is bigger than your dog, antagonisms. It is one of the unsettlings of the book of Job. But in his trial, Job discovers a flaw in his character his dismissal of some of the people, of us, those on the outskirts, gypsies, or Indians in the estimation of General George Custer. Job remains faithful to God, but the uncovering of his attitude is the arc of the plot line. Job repents and eventually, eventually God restores his possessions and 10 more children are born. A poem from the book. Asento. From Job chapters 29 and 30, he takes two chapters to talk about his accomplishments. I delivered the poor that cried and the fatherless and him that had none to help. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was father to the poor. The cause I knew not, I searched out. My root was spread by the water. The dew lay all night upon my branch. Men kept silent at my counsel, their tongue cleaved to the roof of their mouth. Justice was my robe. I broke the jaws of the wicked and plucked the prey from their teeth. Now they hold me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to set with my dogs. They were driven from among men to dwell in clefts, in caves and rocks. They cut up mallows and juniper roots for their meat. Among the bushes they brayed, and under nettles they gathered. They were children of fools, children of base men. They were viler than the earth. But note, yikes, there it is. Unlike the impenetrable Leviathan, Job is descaled. He thought himself a righteous man, yet his trials uncover the shortcomings in his snippish and arrogant attitude. In the beginning of the book of Job, Job says, the thing I greatly feared is come upon me, Job 
What was Job afraid of? His answer is in Job 10, 22, a land of darkness as darkness itself and the shadow of death without any order. It's those three words. It was the possibility of uncertainty that interrupted truth as Job saw it. It was the possibility of other possibilities that diffused meaning Job was certain of that cracked open Job's certain world. It is what Native Americans feared as they saw the encroachment of the Europeans and as they lost 90% of their population in the smallpox epidemic of the late 18th century. It is what I fear in the current pandemic and in the political upheaval that threatens the foundations of the country I know. Maybe Job feared this multivalent world of relativity without any order, shifting, changing, becoming skewed. We think the world should be as we think it should be. We want God to be in our image. When writing, I often felt the thread of discontinuity. It was a whirlwind that rearranged the structure of the book and other furnitures were in what was left of my house. Poetry is a self-imposed isolation, a brokenness and an intrusion. It is both an intruder and the one intruded upon. Often I found Job in the middle of what I was doing, current to the time in which we are trying to survive. Another poem, He Liveth. Were it a whale, the sea had its bounds, but not suffering. Job lost all. His friends went bazooka with accusations. If Job did not understand at first, then who, I asked, could understand God? who would brag to Satan, who in turn would say, give Job to me and see the stuffing in the overstuffed benefactor, who fed orphans and widows and was benevolent to the nth degree in chapter 29th, the self-sung Job and all he did and was in us. It was there at midnight I found the exit to Walmart off Interstate 35 in Wichita, where I waited out the storm in my car until light. I know my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job 19.25 And thus it was in the deepest bite of rain that sadness was a perpendicular line upright to heaven. Because of Job's sorrow and restoration, I could handle the benefits of God, working on things until I came forth through loss with more than in the beginning a shape in the ball of suffering, like that in the furnace, but none were burned. Sometimes I felt a governmental word, a preamble, that appeared for some of the poems. This is from the long arc of my driving. July 20th, 2017, I drove from Eastern Kansas to the Ash Hollow Historical Site Park, State Park in Western Nebraska to view seven Native American artifacts on loan from the Smithsonian. I-70 West to US I-83 North to I-80 West to US 26 West at Oglala to the State Park, 563 miles on the long arc of my driving. Long drives in a short time have become a means of research. My forward going on the road discovered a backflow, a term I found in physics, meaning quantum particles can reverse and travel partially in a direction opposite of their momentum. I make these research trips alone. I can't be with anyone. I have to travel by myself to connect with the past. The 1885 battle at Ash Hollow had several names, the Harney Massacre, First Sioux War, Blue Water Creek Battlefield, Nebraska Territory, a punitive massacre for the Grattan Massacre the year before when 30 U.S. soldiers were killed by Indians near Fort Laramie. At Ash Hollow, 85 belligerents were killed, 70 women and children captured, marched 140 miles to Fort Laramie. Teepees were looted. Army Lieutenant G.K. Warren took artifacts and later gave them to the Smithsonian. The artifact I was interested in seeing was a doll made of tanned leather 
dress of blue wool cloth, the hair a divot of horsehide, with the hair attached. Eyes and mouth were black beads. The doll wore Lakota female short leggings and moccasins. After I read the description of the artifacts, I believe sometimes I heard the doll's voice, not an audible voice, of course, but that a presence would be there. When I saw her in the case in the interpretive center, I named her dressed in trophy clothes. It was not the girl's mother who made the doll, not her grandmother, but an uncle with his knife cut a piece of tanned hide. The girl was not yet old enough to sew a doll, never would be. There were strands of horse hair in the doll's head. A relative sewed two black eyes for beads and two black beads for a mouth. The doll had no ears. She was missing an arm. The doll's dress was navy blue wool. There was a row of blue and white beading around the shoulders of the dress. Around the bottom of the skirt were four narrow strips of cloth. Around her ankle, the beaded edge of her leggings, she wore beaded moccasins. Could she be dressed in the remnants of a U.S. military uniform? Wasn't the beading on her shoulders epaulets, the stripes of tan cloth from a soldier's trousers? Did the girl's uncle cut pieces of cloth from a soldier after the Grattan massacre when it was the soldiers lying dead on a field? The beads were trade beads, but the wool cloth? The look on the doll's face was dazed as she stared ahead. It was as if, it was as if the Harney massacre had just stopped, and now it was the Indians a year later who were dead. Her leather face darkened with the years, her other arm pulled loose in the grip of the dead girl. The end of my craft talk. Thank you, Diane. Um, Wow, where do we even begin? I wanna make sure that we have time for our, our questions on Twitter. But thank you so much for that talk. Thank you so much for your book. Um, I'm gonna be a little selfish and uh, ask a couple of questions first. Um, and we were talking earlier about Blake and about Job and how it makes a lot of sense um, to think about Job through Blake as a lens because of the visionary art, the ecstatic practice of Blake, the ecstatic torture of Blake. Um, but I, you know, I, until I encountered your book, I don't think, you know, that this kind of connection between um, your Native American uh, heritage, your, your identity as a poet who is in between worlds uh, would necessarily um, be in dialogue with Job, certainly with Blake, but not so much Job. So maybe, uh, may, could you tell me when did it occur to you to have this kind of a reading or read through or engagement with these artists? I started some early poems about eight years ago and they were straight narrative. And the more I worked on the book, the more it started to splay into prose, a poetic prose and and um, more abstract poems and narrative poems and form poems, the Sestina, the Villanelle. And I worried very much about what I had and how it was all going to tie together. And I kept writing introductions as sewing, as stitching as my grandmother used to do to hold the disparate pieces together. And then I got out my book of Job again that I've had for 44 years. And I saw what he did with his illustrations and that gave me permission mm -hmm. to go ahead with this strange upsetting book that I had of what is this? And could I trust the instinct that I had to mix all these different pieces together? And so I stuck with it and I was talking to Ruth Greenstein and I said, would you like to see this book? And she said, yes, and published it. I'm so grateful to her. Well, I'm certainly grateful to Ruth and Turtle Point Press uh, and, and indebted to you for seeing this work through. Uh, another question I had is, uh, I'm also just struck by the courage that your writing shows to, um, I wouldn't say embrace, but really um, enfold uh, the, the Christian narrative of Job and also the mm -hmm. mission school experience of Native Americans, which is mm -hmm. profound and which we are mm -hmm. still uh, 
reckoning with, slowly reckoning with. I know exactly. I spent some time. I spent some time in Canada, and this has been very much in the minds mm-hmm. of the dominant culture of late. But it's still mm-hmm. a little too much work to be done. And here, your work is finding a third way to negotiate the Christian faith with the Christian history and the native uh, experience of the Christian missionary school. Would you comment on on how you worked with all of this? Well, again, the, the dissident pieces that don't fit together, again, that great conflict, there is really no resolution yeah. between the Christian missionaries that came and established boarding schools that were a form of torture for the the native students there who were ripped off of language, of culture, of everything they they were about. The boarding schools did a terrific job of killing the spirit. And I think it's taken forever to, to reclaim or recounter and get over that. And yet at the same time, as I grew up, I wasn't in a boarding school. I grew up in Kansas City, Missouri in elementary school. My father took us to church. And for some reason, it got through to me, and I understood the significance of the Bible, first of all, the language. And then I loved the stories, and I loved the message of it. And I thought, how can this be reconciled with the reality that I know? And I'm probably the only one that it has worked for. I think everyone else has put them off from Christianity. But it has been a great strength to my life. I've lived a long time, and that message has stayed with me. I'm so sorry, but it has. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't need to apologize to me. I, I totally understand it. I, I remember when I was in a pretty dark place in my life. I'm not, I'm not a practicing Christian, but I'm, I was raised Catholic. And a colleague of mine in a social worker's office, I was working in downtown east side Vancouver, really trying to support um, the community down there. And I was handed King James Bible because I expressed curiosity in the language in the Bible. And I actually mm-hmm. read and reread and poured over the book of Job. Um, and I, 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 I totally appreciate where you're coming from in terms of as a poet and you encounter just the language of the King James Bible. And then you have the book of Job, which is um, yes. just perpetually inspiring. Um, I think I will, turn it over to uh, Twitter questions now uh, and switch over to my colleague, Reggie. Uh, Reggie, how are we doing with our Twitter questions? I I, I do have a comment here from um, at KBMCC. She says, Diane Glancy is a treasure. Um, And that that sounds like as assured a statement, a declaration as I can offer on, on that position. Yeah. Uh, Okay, well, Diane, maybe you can talk about your career, because one of uh, the points in your book that really struck me is in the the sequence or the prose poem, The Bat House, where you have this line where, two lines where you write, native heritage is not always in categories. I have been a controversial non-fit in both worlds. I have wanted to give up Mm -hmm. on trying to be in either one. And yet here we are. Right, so many decades <laughs> later, how many collections right. of poetry? Right, so mm-hmm. maybe you can tell us about the arc of your career. Uh, you did this amazing anthology with Mark Nowak looking at experimental indigenous writing, and I get a sense of you writing from the margins as a place of strength and um, uh, mobility as opposed to necessarily keeping you down and which it could also be experienced as such. I'd rather read, but I'll talk a little bit and then you can interrupt me and have me read something else. (laughs) That's like a poet. I uh, I get it. I get it. I started out as artist in residence at the State Arts Council of Oklahoma. It must have been 1982 where every Sunday night you got out your map and you found the towns way out in western Oklahoma where you were going, Visay or Godibo or Lawton, Oklahoma, sometimes Edmond, sometimes Tahlequah. And I did that for about six years. And I always had faith that something else would open up. And I went to a writer's conference and I met a faculty member at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop. And so I went there in 1987. 
And I was there. And when I finished, McAllister College in um, St. Paul, Minnesota called me. And I was there for 20 years, all the time writing. Um, and after I retired from McAllister, I had a visiting professorship at a couple of other colleges. And currently, I teach at Carlo uh, in the MFA program. So it's always been continually driving. I have a piece in here I just love about driving in a snowstorm from Pittsburgh, if you want to hear that, because I'm running very yeah, short sure. on what else to say about my career, okay. except I was sure. very, very <laughs> okay, blessed. Great. January 11th, 2019, I left Pittsburgh after my last class at Carlo University in a low residency MFA program. The morning classes were over at noon. I didn't stay for the rest of the day, but drove from downtown Pittsburgh to 376 West along the Allegheny River to 79 South to I-70 West at Washington, Pennsylvania, across the narrow slice of West Virginia into Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, to the border of Kansas. It was a road I was familiar with. I had driven it before, more than once before. By 5 p.m. in Illinois, it was dark. East of Effingham, I saw a haze in the headlights of the eastbound lane. It was snow. It was still snowing when I reached Kansas City at 5 a.m. the next morning, January 12th. I drove over the road with the slow patience of Job. Exit ramps were filled with snow, with a ridge to get across if a snow plow had passed. I got off only for gasoline. The snow coming toward the car was a circle of orbiting stars. Snow fell steady on I-70. Sometimes it sounded like sleet. I love it. And I'm, I'm getting ready soon to go back okay. to Texas. I go back and forth between these <laughs> two places. When I'm in my car, that's where I belong by myself, traveling along. Okay, sometimes there was a brief respite. I found my place, but it continued to snow. I crossed the bridge across the Mississippi and Missouri rivers at St. Louis. The Missouri River again at Boonville, midway across the state. The limestone bluffs were white walls. It was a closed-in world, a terrain of white. Trucks and a few cars passed. A small caravan of Job's camels from us. <laughs> Some of them in the ditch ahead. See, I told you Job was with me wherever I went. He travels too. Uh, the snow-covered lane markers. I recognized the buzz of tires in the warning grooves at the edge of the road, and the driver got back on the road slowly, more slowly, 250 miles across Missouri at 40 miles an hour, sometimes less, never more. It was a time of cold and darkness, yet the snow was lit as if by a dim night light. It was a time of slow momentum when the old world showed itself. I continued through into the snow and through, knowing always it was there to be taken, to be used when the world I knew came to an end, as maybe at the end of life when the driving was driving home. You haven't stopped me. The old ones traveled with the car. I followed them through the snow. I knew they were with me. They were the car, the snow, the way through the snow. I heard their old stories in the voice of the snow. The brokenness held together with stories. They called the snow to hide the animal behind the storm. A terrapin walked with it. The storm was an old being. Many had walked with it. The cold is a predator. It stalks its prey, biting first the toes, the fingers, then working its way to the heart. The car is a hunter. The car is a spirit. I am in the car that continues on the road. It is the old ones holding the car there. The car is an island in a white sea. The car is old migration trails. It is a sledge, not a hammer, but sleigh or sled moving through the snow. How often words are at war with themselves, carrying meanings that have nothing to do with one another. How often the car leaves the road and connects with old journeys. How often one meaning becomes many. Thank you. Um, where are you? Where are you with this book now that it's about to be published? It's coming out in June. You work on a book for eight years, and a book that is as monumental and personally, spiritually, culturally, 
profound as uh, your new book, Island of the Innocent. Um, how do you feel? I mean, where are you with your writing? Are you back to writing again? Is your practice one that's daily or after you've taken a ride in your car? What's it like for Diane Glancy? You know. Well, Paolo, I lead a very sedate life. I work at writing every day. I have multiple oh, projects, a play, some wow. poems, some more. Days. I don't always work eight years on one book, but this one was difficult because I was finding my identity, my way through the morass, my way in a car through a snowstorm. It often felt like that, um, writing the book. Sometimes a book is a gift and it comes easily and swiftly, but others give you a little bit more trouble. And I like them just as much as the easy ones. So that's my life. And I've got grandchildren. I travel to help with them. But, and then I have students at Carlo. I love to get their essays. I got one just today. This is the first of the month and they send their work into me. So I read through it and make comments on it. And, and uh, it's really delightful. I'm a person of few words, and but I can read. <laughs> and you can certainly write with words. I mean, this is a 200-page book, so uh, I am just grateful that we can have this conversation. How have you been since the blip, since sheltering in? Everything okay? And yeah, it's just of, uh, fine. I've really, okay? I really prefer it to being with a lot of people. I'm basically an introvert and I've always had a life of reading and writing and um, traveling. I love to get in my car, as you can tell. I bought, if I can remember the miles, I bought a new car last April, a Ford Edge. My previous car was a Ford Edge and I now have 28,000 miles on it. I noticed it the wow. other day because I had to have a gasoline change. But when you drive to Pittsburgh from Kansas, that's 840 miles right there. And by the time you get back, yeah. it's around 2,000 miles. And then Kansas to uh, Texas is 482 miles. And I do that at least mm. once a month. And then I get in my oh, car God. and I drive sight or I think better in my car. And I ideas occur to me in momentum, in the movement over the land. My sense of place is in the moving. And I understand things much better when driving. And I've always had to do that. Necessity, my first job when I was the artist in residence for the State Arts Council of Oklahoma, it's probably 300 miles from Tulsa down to Lawton. And I would drive that all the time. It just always came. It's where I belong in my car, I guess. Wow. And, um, you know, I wonder if someone from Ford is watching this and you get the idea <laughs> to invite you to be the great spokesperson for Ford and, and it's called Ford Edge, no less for an experimental writer like you. Yes, I've and had, I think I've had two Ford version. Edges in a row. It was a Chevy Equinox, Equinox and it had a little over 200,000 miles on it because I also had a job in California and I would drive from California. And anyway, I gave it to my son and he's still driving it just to school where he works and it has close to 300,000 miles on it. And my other edge I gave to my daughter-in-law and it's somewhere over 2,000 miles. So we definitely, all right. we definitely like the letter <laughs> E in our car name selection and we choose the car names appropriately. Edge and Equinox. All right, over to you, Reggie. What's the question? Okay. Okay, this is from um, At Smallest Leaf. Missed a lots of the reading, but I'd love to hear about Diane Glancy's writing process. She is very oh. prolific. Does she have a writing okay. rhythm? Wow. I think it comes from being an introvert and not real good with spoken words unless I'm reading, then I, then I like to speak. And so you have all of this going on inside of you and what are you going to do with it? And so I began writing and that was my outlet in the written word. I sort of knew that was where I belonged early on. And so remember I have a sedate, boring life. And so all I have yeah. to do is to get up in the morning and think which project am I going to work on? And I often can't wait to get to my computer and something opens up or I've dreamed about something in the night and a development on another, on another piece or something that I would yeah. not have thought about. And so I just sit by myself and work all the time. 
It comes from a long and interesting life, too. Things just kind of accumulate over the years, and there's still so much I want to say. Yeah. One thing I noticed about reading this work was how um, seamless the, the prose sentence and the poetic lines were. And I think the way in which you are able to um, um, have one line inhabit the other's line uh, has, a way to, has to do with, I guess, a certain, not mischief, but playfulness with, you know, how final, yes. the, prose, the, prose <laughs> sent, how final the prose sentence is, and that becomes a line in your poems with the end stop, with the period, and then with your prose lines, you have the disjunctions of uh, interrupting a sentence of thought with a quote from Job or a Chippewa um, a poem in translation mm -hmm. with no formal distinctions. Like it's just a part of the work. And, That's right. Um, yeah, uh, it, it, it's a really a gives a lot of permission to certainly someone like myself who is terrified by prose writing and the sentence because it does feel like a sentence <laughs> when I'm writing, when I'm trying to write in prose and I don't quite have the same magnificent ear that perhaps you have developed by listening to your amazing soundtrack on all these long car rides. I was going to tell Paolo, all you do is take your prose sentences and fragment them and interrupt them and take out some of the grammar. And so they're all run on and you just disrupt them. It's like the thoughts inside of your head, the way they flow with one another, not always in proper form. And you just take a risk and hope what's on the page is what was going around in your head. Yeah, if I may just say something to our, our, our listeners and viewers who have stuck it out and are with us at this point in the stream. <laughs> You are getting an awesome master class right now with Diane Glancy on how to really open up the sentence. Um, and also for our viewers who are joining us late, we actually are recording this stream. So if you're brave enough to return to our site and forgiving enough to return to our site and watch the stream from the beginning, you'll get most of what Diane and I are talking about. Thank you, Reggie. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say to Diane, uh, it's such an honor to be having this conversation with you. I apologize for the tricky um, <laughs> internet stuff, right? But everybody's streaming right now. We're competing with DJs, with um, I'm sure all these celebrities uh, who um, are doing their own thing. <laughs> and so thank you for doing this. Um, uh, big shout out to you over in Kansas. Uh, Shawnee uh, Mission, uh, and um, mm -hmm. please uh, let us know um, what is uh, what is next for you. Uh, I look forward to having you back. Come to Poets House, Poets House, when we reopen. And thank you for your mm -hmm. magnificent work. Thank uh, you, Diane Glancy. Me. Everyone, thank you so much, Diane. Check out her website, uh -huh. DianeGlancy.com. I just wanted to, again, express my deep appreciation to everybody who tuned in tonight. And I'm just grateful that you stuck it out. And uh, I just wanted to also uh, let you know that your generosity supports poetry and certainly supports our organization, allows us to provide um, free programs like this for the public, certainly in a time when the world is looking for poets like Diane Glancy to connect with and to hear from and also to discover and, and learn from. Uh, we are going to have our next live stream next Thursday, and it's going to be a program on Ithil Kulkun, the occult poet, uh, visual artist, all around genius. And it will be presented by um, the Kulkun biographer and scholar Amy Hale and the fantastic poet and tarot practitioner Timothy Liu. Be kind to one another. Let's show love to our healthcare and essential workers. Thank you again for viewing. I'm Paulo uh, Javier, Program Director of Poets House. See you soon.